Amen. All right. Well, thank you for that great prayer, bro. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can dive in here a little bit. And uh, guys, I am just so, so very grateful for the extra week. You guys are so kind uh, because there, there is so much to, to say about this, so much about the pattern of discipleship that I don't want us to miss. And so I'm super grateful that we can uh, take some time and really start to kind of wrap our mind around the process that God has always called men to. There's always been an invitation. There's always been a time of, of apprenticeship. And there's always been a time where they were called to be partners uh, with God and with one another uh, in this endeavor. And tonight we're going to look at one particular character who's kind of in between Moses and Jesus on our kind of major building block uh, personalities, and that's the person of Elijah. But before we get into that, I wanted to take a little bit of time to kind of focus in on that apprenticeship to partnership model. And this is not going to answer everything, but I want to show you from, from Scripture, you know, just how this was working out in our New Testament church. Uh, because there's going to be overlaps between what we see happening in the book of Hebrews and what we see happening in the life of Elijah. So let's uh, let's take a look here together. Uh, and again, tonight, I want to focus a little bit on how does one go from apprenticeship to partnership? How, what, what makes that transition? Um, and I think there's a great example of this uh, in, in the book of Hebrews. Now, the book of Hebrews, we don't know who the author is. There's been lots of suggestions thrown out there, very educated guesses. Uh, but regardless of who wrote it, the book of Hebrews is unique out of all the letters of the New Testament. It's unique because it is exactly how a first person in encounter with a first century leader would feel like. It is basically a written sermon. It's written in homiletic style. All of the letters of Paul, all the letters of Peter, all the letters of John, all have this sense of, yeah, they're inspired, but here am I writing from a distance to you, the church. All those, it, it, they all have the same format except the book of Hebrews. And I think we need this letter because it, it, it instructs us on how would a first century leader kind of help a church that's a little bit, it's suffering from an identity crisis. And, and as you read through the letter, through that lens, you'll notice how often he uses the we language. Instead of you and I, he uses a lot of we language, except, except when the church needs to be admonished a little bit. And, and I want to show this highlight because it kind of shows that there was a practice of apprenticeship in the first century church that had been systematized at least to this congregation. So let's take a look here. In Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, it says, Therefore let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instructions about uh, cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. And I know when we read this, we just kind of go, okay, what, what's really going on here? And why are these, teaching, these teachings elementary? You know, the idea coming from the Greek as these are the ABCs. But I want to point out something that's really interesting, that there is a foundation on which the first century church saw itself. It had a foundation of repentance and faith in God. And I think that's really key. Because remember when John and Jesus started their ministry? You remember the first sermons we have recorded? They're all, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe. See, there is a foundation that everyone needs to be brought into. Everyone needs to be given uh, the same start, the same shared experience 
of coming into right thinking about God and Christ, and then coming into faith that empowers you to le live it out. But then on top of that foundation, we have these building blocks. You know, uh, the this is the new NIV, you know, instruction about cleansing rites. You know, the, the actual Greek is just baptisms, but baptism is such a buzzword. I understand why the translator said, hey, we need to clarify that we're not talking about Christian baptism. We're talking about what do what do the audience, what do they do with the, the traditions they've been taught, the rituals they've been taught? What, what is it that they needed to hold on to? And what is it that they needed to let go of? To, to the writer of Hebrews, this was something that was elementary to this congregation's faith. They were taught about it. Everyone shared in this understanding that there are certain things about our heritage that is okay to let go of because now we have Christ. And if you see it, need to see more examples of that, just read the first part of Hebrews. I mean, Hebrews chapter one, Jesus is greater than angels. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than the temple. I mean, Jesus is just greater. And because Jesus is now the main interpreter of the Old Testament, there are certain practices that needed to be taught to this Jewish audience that had all become Christians. And then, of course, the laying on of hands, the, the understanding of the roles that people were meant to play within the congregation. You know, and we see this idea of laying on of hands happening in the book of Acts as people are are appointed to certain tasks, are given certain commissions, or are given certain roles to play within the congregation. This was part of their basic training. This was part of the ABCs of what they, after baptism, now what? This is what they were given. Uh, the resurrection of the dead, they were, they were constantly taught. And we see this in the book of Acts. Uh, the, the resurrection of the dead was the reliable proof that people needed to understand and knew how, needed to know how to give to others. Where does the church's hope lie? Where does the church's strength lie? What, what, are, we, what are we basing our hope on? Well, it's the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. That settles all discussions on who we should follow. That settles all discussions on who we need to listen to in order to be what God calls us to be. This was part of their basic training. Uh, and then eternal judgment. You can just think of that as righteous thinking. You know, the rest of the letter, you know, we see the, the author of Hebrews kind of going back to this, going back to remember, remember, think about these things. The, the hall of fame of faith, remember your leaders, do not give up meeting together, remember to come together. It's this idea of thinking with heaven in your, in your headlights. I want to be ready. I know it's coming, and I, I just want to start to fixate my thoughts and my life around these basic things. Now, I know that's kind of wordy, but I think the thing that I appreciate about this is that we have a first century witness to this idea that, yeah, this author was about to go all into uh, Melchizedek, which is not elementary teaching, but he had he makes this comment as if to remind them, hey guys, you you have been apprenticed, you have been taught, you have been given a foundation of repentance and faith, and on top of that, you've been given a filter of how to view certain rites of Judaism, how to view uh, the the roles within the church, how to how to trust in the resurrection of the dead, and how to think like one who doesn't live for the here and now, but is living for the great by and by that is to come. You know, make, make decisions according to the eternal perspective. Cool stuff. But I think the thing that I want to show you is that these are the thing, the very problems that we're facing right now as a church, they're not new. You know, they also had to kind of get reminded, like, well, what do we believe? What were we taught? How do we filter through? Here, here the author is just like kind of going, man, let us move on. Yeah, you see the we language, you know, let us move on. We got to get to Melchizedek. I want to give you this blow away view of God and what he's doing, but I don't want us to forget 
that we just didn't get here by by happenstance. We are here because God had a plan. He had a process and we get to follow that process. So that was a bonus. It's uh, if those that have my notes kind of go, hey, this isn't in the notes in session three. <laughs> You're right. I just thought I'd add that one in for a freebie. Okay. So so when we think about what, what it then means to move from apprenticeship to partnership, I think it's also helpful to kind of just see someone that God honors as one that moves very quickly right to the heart of God. And that's our, that's our, our subject for tonight. That's Elijah. You know, Elijah has got to be one of the coolest characters in all of the book of Kings. So cool because he basically just shows up out of nowhere. Uh, check this out. It says, now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Galilee, uh, Gilead, sorry, uh, said to Ahab, as, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will neither be dew nor rain nor any, uh, I'm sorry, do no rain in the next few years, except at my word. I mean, that's bold, right? I mean, that's, you know, like that picture showed, that's, that's this wiry old prophet coming up and putting a bony finger into the king's face. And the king was, was, was taken off guard. And, and wow, what a prophecy. What, what an amazing statement. But the most thing, amazing thing about this passage is what it says next. You know, as the God of, uh, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will neither be dew nor rain uh, the next few years, except at my word. And then look, it says, then, then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. So if you're a good Bible student, the first thing you're going to ask yourself is, so what, bef what about before then? Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. But what about before then? I mean, do you see the tension? We don't have any introduction of Elijah except uh, 1 Kings 17, 1 and 2. All of a sudden, this guy out of nowhere comes up, gets in Ahab's face, prophesies, and, and says, accept at my word. And then, then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. And it really gives us some great insight into what James meant. You know, when he said, Elijah was a man and with a nature like ours. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again and heaven gave rain and bore its fruits. You know, we have this incredible scene in 1 Kings 17 that says Elijah was acting on a faith. Well, where did that faith come from? Was it inspired? Well, we're not told. Uh, did, he, did he get a visit from God like Moses did in the burning of the bush? We're not shown that, but we are reminded that God did say that if Israel were to abandon the ways of God, God would shut up the heavens and not allow rain to come. James, looking back at this moment, gives us this amazing statement that Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Elijah was like us. What he had at his disposal was the word of God and prayer. Kind of like we do. And when you start with a foundation, of repentance and faith, and you're given the tools. Well, what tools do we have? We have the word of God, which Elijah believed to the point where he was willing to act on it and confront Ahab. As he acts on it, then the word of the Lord comes to Elijah. And so a couple of things we learn from this scene is that God, for someone who is going to be invited, to, to be a disciple, to join this journey, for that person to go from apprenticeship to partnership, they got to have th two things that are necessary. The first is passion. They got to have passion. 
you know, and passion is a, is a daunting word because we think of passionate men and passionate women who are just always on the attack and always kind of charging the hill and always doing this. But passion, I think what we see from Elijah isn't this kind of bold faced prophet, but it's someone who believes the word of God enough to act upon it, to go for it, to kind of follow it. And if it says it, he believes it and puts it into practice. You know, he, he had the word. You know, he saw the scriptures, but then he saw what was going on around around him, and he just went for it. And I think this looks differently for everyone. I'm a pretty passionate guy, so I tend to get loud when I get fired up, and I, I tend to kind of always have something smart to say, and, you know, I'm terrible to have in a serious meeting because I'm the smart aleck in the room. I know Doug can't relate to this at all, but there are those of us who are extroverted, who love this stuff, and come on, let's get together. Let's talk it out. Let's, you and me, we got this. I mean, we got passion, right? But passion, without it being grounded, on the foundation of repentance and faith is oftentimes foolish. And the most, sometimes the most passionate people are those that just, maybe they're even introverted. What? They, they're introverted, but man, when God says it, they just go for it. They put it into practice. You know, Elijah did what he thought the Bible called him to do. He had to do something about his nation. He had access to the king in this one moment. He goes up and he puts that, that finger into his face. And then, bam, then the word of the Lord came to him. And it would be, it would be such an important beginning because, you know, Elijah was just getting started in his, in his desire to turn things around. You know, we, we know that, uh, that he would have the greatest barbecue in human history. You know, he would, uh, he would go up and kind of challenge, you know, after the, after, uh, after the, uh, the pursuit of Ahab after him, he would, he would go down and, and face them after the drought and kind of call kind of a, Hey, you bring your boys. I'll just show up and we'll just see whose God is whose, you know, chapter 18 of first Kings is one of the great all time. You know, if you need to get fired up, I mean, read that chapter. You see, you see Holy smack talk happening as Elijah makes fun of their God as Elijah kind of, kind of, you know, yell louder. Maybe he's deaf. Maybe he's busy. Maybe he's in the restroom. I mean, it's, it's, it's classic, classic smack talk. It's awesome. And we kind of go, wow, that's, that's real passion. And then of course, you know, he goes the extra mile pouring, you know, he's got a sacrifice there. The God that was going to be the true God uh, is going to answer with fire. He pours water. I mean, just such great theater, right? He's, he is setting it up and he says a short prayer. God answers with fire and wow, wow. God answers. And, and then of course, uh, you know, the, the crowd response, you know, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God, which is funny because in Hebrew, the Lord, he is God is the word Elijah. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? So add this great vi victory. They're chanting, Elijah, 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 the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And so you can just kind of see this, this incredible victory. Wow, such passion. You know, this would be such an important moment in Israelite history that every single son was raised with the hope that he would have the passion of Elijah. Every, every parent of a daughter hoped that they married someone, you know, who had the passion of Elijah, but not just the passion to go and to call people out, not just passion that goes, because we're going to find out that that really wasn't the type of passion that God was looking for. You know, the type of passion that carries you through usually isn't the big moments of daring. It's in 
the moments that follow. Let me show you what I mean. You know, uh, Elijah confronts, Elijah listens to the word, Elijah prays. It's awesome. He's a man like us. But then we kind of we kind of get to this idea of the type of person that Jesus was calling were Elisha types, right? You know, these were fishermen. These were tax collectors. These were zealots, uh, political terrorists. Uh, these were kind of suburbanites. Uh, you know, you just, you see Jesus just gathering around the kind of guys that if Jesus could give, could show them their, his understanding, these type of men would do it. They would, they would see the word, they would pray, they would act. That was all the pre-qualification they needed. That was passion. But I think the most passionate thing we see Elijah do is when he is when he fails. Because if you're going to grow, if you're going to mature into being a partner, you know, someone that that is going to go out and see if there's a love connection between the groom and part of the bride, you know, someone that's going to show up to church and say, hey, how the how is the bride looking today? Uh, someone that is going to be a part of the great celebration because he's protected the honor of the groom. He's protected the dignity of the church. You know, if that sort of person is going to do there, how does one go from just kind of starting off with repentance and faith and getting to the point where they're now a friend, they got to go through this process of passion and then failure. Let me, let me, let me tell you, let me, let me read to you uh, the beginning of uh, 1 Kings 19. It says, now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, how he had killed all the prophets with a sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to uh, Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom, a broom brush and sat underneath it and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he laid down under the bush and fell asleep. Wow. This guy just had the greatest victory of all time. You would think, what's a queen? But see, Elijah knew that if you don't get the, the, get the head of the snake, you're not going to kill it. And that all of a sudden now, after all of this victory, after God answering these prayers and sending him his spirit and doing all this sort of stuff, that when he tried and when he did his best, when If you don't turn the king and queen, you haven't turned the nation. He kind of goes, man, it's a loss. I am now a dead man. What was the point of all of that? If God, if you're not going to see it through to the end, there should be revival happening now. And now instead they're answering my life. I have had enough. And he lays down to die. <laughs> And at this point, you might be saying, oh, now I see why James says Elijah was a man like us. Yeah, of course, because there is no smooth transition to partnership. There is apprenticeship that has to come with a certain amount of lumps in your faith in order to get through and to see God as he wants to be seen. If it was all victory all the time, we would only have one template of Elijah, and that would be the bony finger prophet who kind of goes up and just calling out sin wherever he goes. But instead, what we see is that God takes this man who is willing to be so bold and so brave and then allows him to be humbled by the natural consequences of a spiritual life. Anyone who wants to live a godly life will be persecuted. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Do we really believe that? I think sometimes we back off of those things as though they catch us by surprise. Like, I didn't know there was going to be hard times in my life of faith, or 
I thought there was only going to be a few hard things in my life of faith, and I have had one too many. And you get to that point where you say, I have had enough. Oh, man, that is good stuff. Is anyone with me right here? Are you relating to the word of the Lord? Okay, good, because we need to believe it, and we're going to need to act on it. Elijah's in the most of Okay, thank you, Siri. Uh, Elijah is in the most important part of his journey. Can I trust God when I feel like everything I've tried has failed? You know, it's great what happens next. It says all at once, going back to uh, uh, 1 Kings 19, uh, second half of verse 5. It says, all at once an angel touched him and said, get up. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then laid back down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank strengthened by the food. He fat, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into the cave and spent the night. Okay, I want you to just kind of imagine what's going on here. He has laid down to die, but God didn't let him die. God had an angel touch him. We don't know how hard he touched him, but he touched him. And then God fed him. And then he took another nap. And then the angel touched him again, gave him a commission, fed him again. And then he traveled 40 days and 40 nights away from Israel. Israel's way up here in the north under Ahab's leadership. He sends them all the way back down to the very mountain that God called Moses on. Because at this point, it was time for Elijah to get the big picture. 40 days, 40 nights. He is inviting us to a much larger story than our own here in the 21st century. He's inviting us to this idea that sometimes you have to go way out of your way to find perspective. And here God is bringing him to the mountain where the burning bush was, where the, where the, the Ten Commandments were given, where all this amazing history under Moses was. Here's Elijah at this moment in time. Instead of a burning bush and commandments and tablets, what happens? Where does he go? He goes into a cave. And then it says, and the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? Did, did you get that, that, that last bit of that phrase? What are you doing here? As if the voice is up close, kind of in the cave with Elijah. It's like drip it or spill it or. You know, uh, put you on mute. All right. You know, and uh, I, I love the fact that the voice does not say, what are you doing in there, Elijah? Gosh, come out here. I got something to show you. No. What does he say? He get, what are you, what are you doing here, in the cave? I I love this image, because God was about to unleash all sorts of glory. You know, he does have Elijah come forward out of the cave. He does start to flex a little bit. We know the story. You know, uh, you know. It, you know, he said uh, he sent a great and powerful wind and tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then the voice said to him, what are you doing here? You know, Elijah would come to understand that the God that is bringing us to maturity is not found 
and the and the wind that destroys, the earthquake that disrupts, or the fire that consumes. God is found in that still small voice that's if that's with you even in your moments of being let down or feeling like you let down God. Now, here's here's a truth that I don't want you to miss. You cannot let down God because you never held him up. And if you're a parent of teens, you need to tell them that a thousand times over. You can't let down anyone you're not holding up. You know, and I think this is the moment where Elijah was then given the big picture. You know, because God goes on to address his concerns. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. You know, and he it's interesting. He goes, Hey, I need you. Here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna go back the way you came. You're going to appoint some kings that'll handle the political. You're going to appoint a military guy. He's going to handle the army. But then you are going to call a man to follow you, Elisha. It's amazing that in this moment of kind of coming through his failure, meeting him in the cave, addressing his need, pulling him away from, from the things that could distract him and speaking to him alone, God's answer to Elijah was, you need someone to disciple. This is not about you. I have 8,000 who have not bowed their knees. This is kingdom moment. This is big time, but you cannot experience this growth without going through a little bit of failure. And where do I see Elijah's passion in that? It's in the fact that he went and he called and he walked with the one that was going to get double of what he had. I think that's, that's awesome. Another true, true statement that's worthy of consideration is you only fail when you stop trying. And I think for us, when we think about the story of discipleship and, and how, we, how we think about it, a lot of us have stopped trying. That's the only way we can fail. Elijah shows us that the best part of our maturing in faith comes after we come into something and we kind of go, oops, that didn't go the way I thought it would go. And then we kind of go, okay, God, I need to hear from you. And you, you go get real with God and then God gets real with you. And when he gets real with you, you start to realize like, wow, he is with me here the whole time. God doesn't change his mind about you. He doesn't change his mind about me. Even though we may give him a thousand reasons why he should, his decision is final. I have called you. I have summoned you. You're the one. And well, what do you want me to do? And I love that fact. That go back and make disciples. Discipleship is always the answer. It's always the call. Well, why just call one? Well, because that's how we're going to reach the 8,000. That's They're there waiting on y'all. Just go, baby, go. Love it. Love it. And I think this is where we have such a tremendous opportunity as a church to kind of go, man, we have such a head start on the rest of the religious world because we speak a strong discipling ethic. We speak a strong dialect of being in one another's life, but we have to remember just because there might have been a oops a daisy here or there, that's not problem. That's actually natural. That's where God wants us to go. Wow, what are you guys doing here? Oh, wait, you're here with us, God? Yeah, I'm here with you. I never, I, I'm always with you. Now let's go. Well, what do we want to do? It seems like we're failing. No, you're not. Just go. Listen, trust me. There, are, I'm going to introduce you to three. You just hang out with those three, and I'm going to give you one. And through that one, I got thousands. Amazing. It's, it's almost why you can imagine in Matthew 28, when Jesus comes back, you know, Matthew, Matthew 28 is a great chapter because it's the only time uh, that there was a scheduled resurrection appearance. <laughs> you know, they went to the mountain where Jesus told them to go and they're all there and Jesus shows up and they worshiped him, but some doubted. Some were doubting in that great, uh, that great uh, beginning of the church, Matthew 28. And in order to quiet their fears and to give them a reason to worship, he goes, man, all authority has been given to me. I got it all. It's all under me. Here's what I want you to do. 
go make disciples. Discipleship, you, I know you guys don't know what to make of me right now because you're not all used to the resurrection idea, but here's what you all can do. You all know how to do this. Go make disciples. Baptizing them, teaching them, and just know I'm with you always, even if that always leads you to a cave. Even if that always needs to bring you back to your very foundation, I am with you always. So let's talk a little bit right now about a practical. What? Yeah, I'm actually going to give you a practical. Woohoo! You know, remember that this is all about being built on a foundation of uh, repentance and faith, right? Well, how do we have a moment like Elijah? How, how do we incorporate that into our spiritual life? If I'm walking with someone and they're walking with me, how do we know when God is up to something? Well, it's interesting in Mark 1, uh, 15, Jesus's words are so specific. He says, the time has come, not any old time, but Kairos time. The time has come. See, there's two words in Greek for time. There's, there's chronos, which is kind of, kind of clock time, you know, like 12 hours in a day, you know, we, we, I'll meet you at six, you know, this should, this, this devotional should end at eight. That's chronos thinking. So don't think like that in case I go way too long, you know, but there, there is a certain type of time in Greek that gets a special word and that's kairos. And the word that Jesus used was the time, the kairos has come. And that's a specific moment in time that changes everything. And it changes everything on this pattern of repentance and belief. Because that X kind of represents you're on that timeline, you're cruising through life, and then something happens. You know, for a lot of us, it started off with an invitation. We were given either an invite to church or an invite to study the Bible. And for whatever reason, we accepted. Uh, and then as we got into the Bible, we started making observations. You know, we started seeing scripture, not as a good story, but as a story that could be lived out in my life. We, we started to see Jesus didn't want me just to be a nice guy and just be a good, obedient boy. He was actually summoning me to actually join him in building the kingdom. And then that led us to reflection. We started getting asked great questions like, Bill, do you see this in your life? Is this what you do? And of course, the answer for me at that time was no, not even close. Never heard this before. Not even sure I want to do it at the moment, but let me just reflect on it. And, and here we are. And then you had that great discussion about sin, about, wow, that lack of, that lack of calling in your life, that lack of knowing what God's will for your life was this without Christianity, without discipleship leads to a lot of empty discussion. But when you kind of answer the call to be a disciple, and then you start to see sin stops the movement of God. I am out of sorts with God. I am out of step with him. And you have that great discussion, the light and darkness discussion, or whatever we call it now, the sin talk. And then you start to go, wow, I have really have had it all wrong. And you at this point have repented. Your mind has changed. You, you had made an observation, you reflected deeply, and now you're discussing it with other human beings. I mean, you, you know, when you can, you know, if you talk about it, you're, you can get over it. You know, once you give things a name, that's a Bible name, you can repent of it. It is, it is, it is just about kind of falling in line. But see, we didn't stop with just repentance. You know, for a lot of us, we made a plan. We allowed ourselves to be held accountable. And then we started to live that reality out. That's what God was doing in the cave with Elijah. God started with a question, what are you doing here? Which made Elijah kind of, kind of, kind of say the words that he had reflected on time and time again. You know, I, I am no better than my ancestors. I am the only one of the prophets left and everything's a loss. And then, of course, God had a very one-sided discussion. 
<laughs> but but a discussion nonetheless. He showed him he showed him what Elijah would say was power. But then just to let Elijah know, I'm not in these outward workings of power. I'm in the cave with you. Now here's the plan, and he gave him a plan. And then that plan gave gave Elijah someone accountable that he was going to be accountable to and that he was going to be accountable to him. And then they went and put it into action. And for his, for his efforts, he got to go up in a chariot of fire and avoid this whole death business. It was friendship with God. You know, and I think this is, this is important because while we're in each other's lives, a lot of times what we end up doing is that we just do the first three, you know, sort of like, okay, you know, this person, you know, we kind of, everyone comes to that moment where they're like, oh no, I, I, I committed a sin or I'm, I, I'm in a habitual sin. And then you start to go, I want to change the Kairos moment. Right. And so what, what ends up happening is that they get together with their disciple and their other brothers and sisters. And they, they kind of share like, Hey, listen, this is what I've seen in my life lately. And I think this is what it means. This is why it happens. Then they start to ask questions and they have a discussion. And unfortunately, a lot for a lot of us, this is where it ends. We kind of have this mind change. Yeah, I know it's bad. You know, let's pray. But nothing really changes because belief, faith is a verb. You know, you believe something when you act on it. So to repent and believe means you do one side of the circle to be followed up by the other. You, you make a plan. You know, you have an account. I mean, think about that scene in, uh, in, in the beginning of John's gospel when all those people are going up to John and asking, you know, what shall I do? They were going from repentance to believing. They were kind of going, well, if you have two tunics, you know, give someone that has none one, uh, you know, you, uh, you, you, you soldiers, you know, be content with your pay. I mean, he's giving them a plan, which makes them accountable, which then calls them to action. You know, you believe when your life backs it up. And so this circle is kind of this great invitation to have these moments of radical change all the time. But the pattern for this goes all the way back to Elijah in the cave. He was, give, he was called for this moment to kind of stand and face what had happened, his discouragement, his doubt, and what he found was not a vengeful God, but a God that was in the cave with him. And although God flexes for Elijah just to kind of let him know where he wasn't. You know, God's real call was, Elijah, I have a plan for you. This plan will bring you into a community that will help hold you accountable. Because you're a man of action. You're a woman of action. You, you guys, Kairos happens when we observe, reflect, and discuss. But then real change happens when we believe. We plan, account, and action. So I think I'm right at time. So just to review, you know, Elijah was a man like us, not because of this amazing prophetic career, but because he starts off as a guy who reads his Bible and prays. And then he acts on it. And when he acts on it, he kind of starts into this kind of apprenticeship thing where everything he's trying seems to be winning. But then God invites him to a much deeper reality, a much deeper calling as that, that, uh, that apprenticeship led to a, a great failure in Elijah's mind so much that he felt like I'd rather just die. Let me lay underneath this, uh, bro this brush bush and just be dead. And God goes, no, I need you to see something. And then he calls him to repent and calls him to believe and then sends him back, not to be the sole prophet, but to now call others to follow. And so 
that's uh, that's the devotional for this evening. Wow, I, I really, Bill, thank you so much. I appreciate that. I know that uh, uh, there may be a few people with a few questions. We have a little bit of time that we can do that. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, before we finish up, uh, does anyone have a question? You can raise your hand uh, maybe and or type something in the, in the chat, uh, something there and we can uh, pick on that. Okay, there's a lot of thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you uh, going on. Um, you know, it's someone's thinking, I, I am so grateful for the reminder. Uh, you know, James says, show me your faith, you know, by what you believe, and I'll show you my faith by what I do. And I've always kind of, you know, okay, does that mean I have to but you kind of brought that together in that last point. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I've been thinking about this. I've had this in my mind the last probably month or so, the gospel of failure, the Ooh. good news of failure, you know, and uh, just kind of started. Is that copyrighted? To, yeah, it is. It's copyrighted. Oh, okay. just uh, but <laughs> no, needed it ask. isn't. Go, needed anybody could use that one. But uh, that it seems like, God works in those moments. The good news of, of failure, and it's, it's, it's not failure to get out of, the failure is not getting out of the boat. The failure isn't the sinking. And just kind of thinking about that in my life and how I want to do so much for God. But uh, uh, anybody have anything else they want to share or thoughts? Uh, can you further explain, you cannot let God down because you never held him up. That was one of the questions. Would you mind expounding on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think a lot of times, and, you know, of course, you know, having raised uh, three beautiful girls uh, in our churches, you know, kingdom princesses and all that sort of stuff, you know, there is a great fear that I see in them, have seen in them, that I think exists in all of us. We, we sometimes are very hesitant to dare to step out uh, out of fear that as we do, we kind of will mess it up. Uh, in fact, life usually teaches us that there's a good chance, high probability, if I try to do something, I'm probably gonna, I'm probably gonna mess it up. And so we have this idea of I don't want to let God down. But to let something down means that it was dependent on you in order to prop it up. And God is not one of those things. You know, it, God has never been dependent on us for, for this calling. And so when we are called to follow him and to be his disciples and to do things for the kingdom, you know, he, he embraces us warts and all. He embraces us even though, like Elijah, <laughs> we're about to get tripped up and misinterpret what was going on. And, and what he does is that he goes, man, that doesn't, that doesn't bother me. I'm not going to show you wrath. I'm going to show you, I'm in the cave here with you, man. I never left you. I will be with you always. And I think there's some moments where fear gets the best of us. And those are the always moments. Fear usually kind of, kind of comes in some sort of, some sort of mindset that somehow this whole thing is depending on my effort. It's not. It's not. You just get to be a part of what God has in mind. It's not dependent on you. You get to join God in what's, what he's already doing. And so I think if we can address the fear, especially in teens and young people and those of us who've been around for a while who kind of feel like, man, if I had a, if I had a broom tree around here, I might lie under it too, you know? Uh, I think uh, I think hearing hearing this is really important for us. Amen, amen. That's great. Um, there's another one here. Uh, uh, was God walking with Elijah during the time he went to be with the widow? You know, how was their discipling there? Yeah, and and remember, this is God walking with our with our guy, right? Uh, and Jesus would even kind of go, hey, there were a lot of widows in Israel. 
but Elijah didn't go to any of them, did he? He went to the foreigner. What? You know, this is the sort of thing that gets Jesus kind of thrown off a cliff. That's what they wanted to do with him after that one. Um, but but I think I think the thing that we have to see when we look at stories, when we look at narrative, we're not looking for nuts and bolts. We're looking for what does this story show, number one, about God's way of handling us as his children. And, you know, in, in that widow, God brought uh, the prophet out of what would normally be safe territory into the land of foreigners where he, were, where he received kindness and obedience, not like in Israel. These guys were all being disobedient, right? But he received kindness. He provides kindness. And, and already we start to see what Jesus would later use to convince people, hey, you think this story is all about you, but it's not. It's about everyone. And so, yeah, so I, I would say that would be the way that I think we're intended to interpret that. Great, 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 great thoughts there. And maybe the last one, if uh, we could go back to that little diagram. Uh, some people are thinking, okay, so you kind of started with the repentance on the right and then moved to the belief on the left. Uh, can you yeah. kind of go through that? Is it, is it, is it, we start with belief, we start with repentance. I mean, where, where, you know, what, how do you, how do you use this? to sort of help us go. Yeah. And, and I apologize guys, I'm trying to cram a lot into four sessions. So uh, in some ways, I, you know, I, I, I normally don't try to stick this one in so early, but I just kind of felt like next week, I'm going to try to give you what I feel are the best, most helpful practicals. And this one's a little bit deeper, but it matches the story of Elijah. So I apologize for taking a shortcut. Uh, but if you look at if you look at uh, Mark 1 15, Jesus does say repent and believe the good news. There is a pattern. And again, can you start with belief? Sure. But I, I, di I do think that real change, real lasting change, kind of a Kairos kind of change where everything changes starts when you change your mind, when you repent. And, and to change your mind, in order for mind change to happen, observation, reflection, and discussion are very necessary parts of that change. But belief as a verb, uh, I think, is what the, what the first century had more on task than we do. And what I mean by that, like you quoted James, you could think of all the times Jesus noticed someone's faith. You know, the woman bleeding for 18 years, the friends lowering the paralytic down. When he saw their faith, woman, your faith has saved you. These actions kind of show that this is what Jesus honors as belief. This is what Jesus, so, so when Jesus says, repent and believe the good news, that there was going to be a mind change and then there was going to be a change of life. And so what this diagram is trying to do is to give us a workflow to help someone come to the point of, of lasting change. And, you know, and again, it's a circle. Sometimes you got to go through it a few times before you really get it. But, but there, there is, this is how, you know, uh, Kristen and I, uh, you know, work with marriages. You know, this is how we work with singles. This is how we, we kind of help people. We just kind of go, okay, listen, you know, we, you know, we're, we're in these ruts that we're in because we need a mind change. So let's make some observations about this issue. When does this happen? You know, I want you to reflect on this. We need to talk about it. And as we talk about it, kind of go, well, we start asking deeper questions. And what do you think that happens? Well, what do you think we can do about it? Then we start making a plan. Okay, how are you going to hold, you know, if it's a couple, how are you going to help each other out with this? How would you like us to help you with this? Okay, let's see how it goes. And then you know, next time we get together, we kind of go, okay, how did it go? And, and all of a sudden, we're just kind of following this nice little Cairo circle um, uh, that, uh, that I think leads to change. I think, you know, if I'm, if I'm walking with a young man who's dealing with porn, this is what I do. You know, and I just say, man, I'm, I'm going to walk with you through this thing. We may have to go through it many times, but you absolutely can do it. You just have to repent and believe.
um, and then very specifically working it through and not giving up, not selling it short, uh, not taking them through repentance and go, okay, great, let's just pray. You know, but going through, well, let's make a plan. How are you going to hold yourself accountable? How can I help you? Hold, you know, let's uh, let's let's take some action here. That's great. That's great. I appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to next week. You just gave us a teaser, so now we've got to now we've got to definitely tune in next week and get that get that done. But uh, again, thank you guys so much. Um, let me just mention a couple of things as far as announcements. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you, Bill. We're just gonna. Yeah, well, at the end, we'll do our, we'll do our, hey, Bill, thank you very much. We'll all yell yeah. at you and scream at you and do all that. And that's great. But uh, coming up this week uh, is uh, the weekend that the ministry uh, here has decided to plant an official Spanish speaking uh, ministry in the church here in uh, Houston. And so they're going to have their inaugural service this Sunday. And we plan that on the Sunday that's, uh, that, that God could work. It's the Sunday of uh, spring break, and it's the Sunday that you spring forward, and we lose an hour. So we know that whatever happens is going to be of God. Uh, and so remember to move your clocks forward this Sunday and be praying for that uh, 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 service that we're having. Now, that's the Spanish service, but all of us will be meeting in our regular region services as well. They're regional services, but the Spanish is going to have their own special service there at the Westin. And uh, please invite people. You've got an in, uh, invite for it, and that'll be great. The month of March is filled with a lot of great things. Uh, we'll have another meeting here next week where we talk about discipleship uh, and the plan that God has. And then uh, on March 25th, the Central has their regional fun night at the Houston First Baptist. But then the 26th of March, which is a Saturday, is a congregational teaching day. And we're going to be going over some things that the teachers, elders, and ministry staff have all been thinking about. And, and we want to present some ideas of some uh, things that we've been uh, really trying to get deeper on and biblical and hold to the truths so to speak. And so that'll be on Saturday. And then we'll I'll culminate that week in with uh, the 27th, which is a congregational meeting. And we'll all be together for that. And so that'll be great. So uh, that'll be a, a great congregational worship service on the 27th. The triple 5k comes and up. Then on we'll have a, and then we'll have a congregational leaders meeting after that service. Or are we going to be able to do that, Debbie? We get the room space or do we know? Do we get a congregational meeting? Yes. Oh, for the March 26th? Yeah, yeah for, for the, the leaders meeting. Leaders meeting afterwards. Oh, no, I have not done that. Is that okay. going to be at oh. the Westin? You want that yeah. at the Westin? Yeah, we're hoping to do it right after the okay. service since we'll okay. have all the leaders there. So, uh, so Bible Talk small group leaders, we'll let you know as soon as we find that out so you can plan for that. Great. Uh, 31st of March is the triple 5K. That's going to be, it's not going to happen then? Okay, all right. I'm just looking at the calendar. Okay. No, it's changed. And then there's the campus retreat coming up, the teen prom. All those things are going to be on your uh, on your calendar. So look that up. So that'll be a great time. Thank you guys so much for that. Let's remember to pray for our brothers and sisters in Europe, especially the Ukraine and Russia. Uh, let's pray for those in Europe who are going to be housing people. Uh, this is just going to be a, an amazing time as God... You know, in Acts chapter eight, uh, dispersed the church from a great persecution. Maybe this is one of the things he's going to use to really strengthen the churches in Europe. Who knows? But we can pray about that. And, uh, you know, I think the other thing I'd just like to say um, in response to Bill's message is, who are you in an Elijah, Elisha relationship with? Are you really in one of those relationships where you're got that plan and you're helping one another and uh you may have good friends in the church but do you have that person or people few people that you're doing that with and i would say there have been times when i've had great friends and not in a relationship like bill's talking about and that it's just it takes intention and stuff like that to do it so i'd like to call us all to do that amen all right well Doug, uh, Damon, uh, 
Barrett, does anybody on staff have anything else that they need to uh, announce? You killed it, bro. Oh, thank you very much. Well, then if we're talking you... about Bill, honey. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, oh, I thought you were talking about me. Both, both. All right, Bill, thank you so much. I'm going to see, mind if I ask my wife to pray for us to close us out? Father, thank you so much for just another uh, great time to be together, God, and to hear through Bill Molden your just uh, so many insights on what truly, God, it means to have relationships with one another, be iron sharpening iron with each other, God, as we grow in our relationship with you, Father. Thank you, God, for Jesus. Thank you for his example that he set for us on how to have relationships with, with other brothers and sisters, God, and with the lost. Father, we love you. We're so excited about the, the Spanish ministry this Sunday. I pray, God, that you will bless that service in, in many, many ways, God, that so many people will come out and hear your word preached in Spanish. God, that many, many souls will be saved because of this very important ministry, God. We love you. I pray that this week will just uh, be one where we bring you glory, God, in everything that we do. Help us to remember that we are your ambassadors, Father, here on earth. And we love you and are, are so grateful for Jesus Christ. Thank you for Bill and for his teachings tonight, God. And we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, let's, begin, let's begin the fun. Let's say goodbye. <laughs> Thanks, Chill Bill.